Good D-Day, America. It's appropriate that we have a naval story today as D-Day represented the greatest single amphibious assault in history. I keep in my three studios this book, To Provide and Maintain a Navy, by Captain Jerry Hendricks, forward by John Lehman, Why Naval Primacy is America's First Best Strategy, and I keep it because Jerry Hendricks is one of the country's leading navalists. If you read The Atlantic, you read his article on it. Good morning, Captain Hendricks. How are you? Uh, good morning, Hugh. I'm up and about, so uh, been, uh, well, been that's doing good. A bit of reading. We're making progress. How big? Yeah. How astonishing was the D-Day naval lift? Oh, I mean, it's it's a it's a near miraculous if you really think about it, because it's it, everyone thinks about June sixth, uh, but no one really understands that uh, June sixth was just day one of a of a thirty day process, and so. You know, we began on June 6. We we had ships going back and forth between the United Kingdom and France for the next 30 days. We had to keep the sea lanes open. We had to keep the logistics coming. The only way to get that number of troops ashore and hold them was a massive uh, ASW anti-submarine warfare, anti-mining logistics lift. It uh, it was one of the most intricate naval maneuvers processes in the history of the world, and uh, and I think. Eisenhower rightly believed that that was his most significant achievement in his life. Uh, not even the presidency surmounted what he accomplished with Normandy and D-Day. Well, you were the first one to ever tell me he was buried in his uniform because of his belief that he would be remembered for Operation Overlord as opposed to anything else. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. If you look at Eisenhower's funeral, um, his five-star General of the Army flag actually precedes uh, his presidential flag, and uh, he died on active duty. He requested that John F. Kennedy return him to active duty as a five-star general of the armies after he left the presidency, because when he passed, he knew that in 500 years, he always talked about the 500-year test, in 500 years, he would be remembered as the victor in Normandy, not as a two-term president of the United States, and I, I think he's correct. Now, Jerry, let's turn to the, the subject on which you've been helping me. Uh, from the Financial Times this morning, U.S. prepared to address aggressiveness of Chinese military. Yesterday, we played the video, I hope we still have it, of the incident in the Taiwan Strait. And I called up Jerry yesterday. He's my go-to guy in all things Navy. And I said, Jerry, who was watching? What was going on? Will you take listeners, Jerry Hendricks, into what was going on as the American, uh, I think it was a guided missile frigate, right, approached the Chinese uh, 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 transited the Taiwan Strait. Maybe it wasn't a frigate. Tell me everything I need to know. Okay, so an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, uh, a guided missile destroyer, the USS Chung Hoon, um, DDG ninety three, uh, one of our one of our big nine thousand five hundred ton destroyers, was doing a transit through uh, the Strait of Taiwan. Now, the, the Strait of Taiwan is international waters. That is free international waters. And a Luyang-3 uh, frigate of the Chinese Navy, 6,300 tons, comes alongside the port side, the left side of the Chung Hoon, and then crosses 150 yards just in front of her in this maneuver that we can see here uh, if you're watching on, on YouTube. Um, by the way, Chung Hoon was operating in conjunction with a Canadian ally. So there was a Canadian uh, frigate right behind Chung Hoon. So this was an international exercise in international waters to demonstrate that it was the high seas, it is international waters. And this is something that we do uh, quite frequently. So very unsafe maneuver, passing within 150 yards. In fact, an unprofessional maneuver, and this is something that ship drivers look at. Not only is this unsafe, it's unprofessional, and it sort of demonstrates a, a, a lack of proficiency, a lack of training on the part of the Chinese. So you have talked to me for years about the possibility of a, quote, shouldering incident, close quote. Would you explain what that is? And then also, in the context of this weekend's incident, do you think Lloyd Austin was watching in real time the head of PACOM? What was going on back at the, at the White House Situation Room as we approach uh, near miss with a Chinese naval op, uh, vessel? Well, uh, Hugh, you know, these Taiwan Transit Strait uh, procedures, these maneuvers we do, we do these repeatedly. We do these, you know, anywhere between four to six times a year, just to demonstrate that we consider those waters to be international. But we know that when it happens, it's going to excite the Chinese. They do not want us there. They believe that those are their internal waters. Obviously, they claim Taiwan, so they believe the strait between the two. Uh, so I have no doubt that, for instance, uh, Admiral uh, Aquino 
the commander of Indo-PACOM was watching this in real time video coming off the ship uh, because it's just that level. And I'm sure that the uh, the teletype going between Indo-PACOM and then the, the, the situation room in the White House was probably alive with each moment of how things were going because these things are monitored that way. Uh, note that this is, you know, we do these repeatedly. This is not even the most unsafe the Chinese have been. In fact, in 2018, they cut off the USS Decatur. They came within 43 yards of her and caused her to go all back uh, with that. I think that's actually one of the reasons why uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we use the, the, the ship Chung Hoon is one of the two ships that is sunk in Jim Stavridis' uh, 2034 novel that begins the World War III scenario there. So this is something that we see happening repeatedly. And by the way, the Chinese have a real uh, uh, a fear of this particular ship. It's named after our first Asian American Admiral, Gordon Chung Hoon, who was a graduate of the Naval Academy prior to World War II and commanded uh, uh, the destroyer Sigsby in the war. And he won the Navy Cross and the Silver Star. The Chinese think that we actually use the USS Chung Hoon to deliberately embarrass them in the region, highlighting the, the great service of, of, uh, of Asian Americans in our Navy. So they, they really sort of get really sensitized when Chung Hoon shows up because they think that we're sort of deliberately poking him in the eye. So, but anyways, these processes and procedures are normal. What we've seen is them becoming increasingly aggressive. And in fact, I've noted that they've designed a, a new ship, the Type 55 Cruiser, which is 11,500 tons. She's bigger than our destroyers. She has a long, what I call a slab side, a flat side. I believe that ship has been designed specifically to be able to come out and shoulder us where we actually make contact between the two ships and they use their greater mass to shove us out of the way. This is something that the Soviets did on a couple of occasions during the Cold War, 1988 in particular in the Black Sea. They actually came out and made contact with one of our Spruance class destroyers at the time and tried to move it out of, uh, of the waters that they were claiming there in the Black Sea. So I believe that this incident is coming, that, uh, that we will have a shouldering uh, situation. Uh, and if they don't handle it professionally, if they can't drive their ships well, then in fact that could be uh, a collision that could result in the loss of life. None of us want to see that level of unprofessionalism resulting in that type of a disaster. Captain Hendricks, had there been contact, what would have been the result in your professional estimate? Well, given the angle of the approach there, uh, and mind you, 150 yards, uh, you know, we weren't there and we, we had slowed. So I know that they took our ship, reduced her speed down to, to maintain separation. But had they come in and deliberately tried to make contact with that type of angle, you could have seen a puncturing of the hulls of both ships letting seawater in, resulting in loss of life, damage to machinery. Uh, that is what none of us want to see. And in fact, we've had some incidents in the past where there's been you know, impacts between ships where we've lost like the entire bow section of a cruiser uh, way back during the Cold War. And, and so you don't want to see these things. You want to see professionalism. But the Chinese are reacting in a very emotional way. And you saw this with their, the speech given by their defense minister, where he calls these operations, which are normal operations in international waters, he's calling them deliberately provocative and escalatory. And he's doing that in the presence of Lloyd Austin at a defense conference overseas. So it's very clear they want us to back off. And, uh, and the fact that they won't sit down and meet with our Secretary of Defense shows that they believe that they don't have to uh, under the situation. Uh, and that, that disturbs me a lot that they're beginning to view us as the supplicant and them as the suzerain in this or, or the senior power in the region. And, and we've allowed that to happen because we've allowed our Navy to shrink in size and our presence to be reduced. Now, Captain Hendricks, for those of you just turning in, I'm talking with Captain Jerry Hendricks, author of To Bribe, Bide, and Maintain, as well as the uh, key piece in the Atlantic this summer on building the American Navy. I went to a Blue Bubble seminar at my reunion, three China experts. It's Chatham House rules. I can't quote anyone. But the assertion was made in the conversation that we are being provocative when we send aircraft carriers along the coast of China what would we do if a Chinese aircraft carrier came along the American coast? My answer would be, well, if they're outside of internet, if they're outside of domestic waters, nothing, absolutely nothing. Am I right? 
Well, I mean, we would come out and, and monitor their operations as they come out and monitor our operations. We do a large exercise in the Pacific every year. Last year, 23 nations came. China sends their intelligence gathering assets to come out and monitor that operation to try and learn from us. If they come to American shores and operate in international waters, but off our coast, we'll come out and watch what they do, but they are free to do that. That's been part of our uh, tradition and process all along is that international waters is international waters and we want to uphold that. Um, so no, I, I don't think that we would respond aggressively. We would monitor them and put a ship uh, in tail or trail behind them, but no, that wouldn't be escalatory. But the idea that somehow us continuing to operate in the same waters that we've operated in uh, consistently since the end of World War II is escalatory is, is counter to the use of that word. Uh, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, that is not by definition escalatory. You need to change the condition in the environment for there to be an escalation or de-escalation. So that makes no sense to me. And, and by the way, I uh, almost, I almost believe that any panel that does not, any panel without a naval officer uh, on it who served in, the, in those waters and uh, it's just simply not a good panel. Uh, Captain Hendricks, I wanna close by saying, could that have escalated out of control? That incident that we saw, could that have escalated to the point of conflict beyond the ships? Um, I don't know if it would escalate it to war. I think it could have escalated to damage to both of the navies and loss of life with both of them. That would have been an international incident that would have then gone to a negotiating table and we would have you know, protested. The only thing that I think really escalates that leads to war is if someone trains their gun and fires one. And I don't think that was going to happen on either side at this point in time. But I do believe that we are on a slow march towards that type of a moment because they are becoming increasingly emotional, unprofessional, and desperate in their actions because they feel that they're losing face within the region and from the other powers of the region, like the Japanese, like the Taiwanese, now like the Philippines, which is increasingly trending towards the American side in this competition. And they're watching what we're doing with India and Australia. They're very nervous at this point in time. So I think that they are moving towards a moment of desperation where I, you know, I, I cannot predict what they'll do at that moment. Captain Jerry Hendricks, author of this book, which you can still get, To Provide, Maintain a Navy, Why Naval Primacy is America's First Best Strategy. Always a pleasure to see you, Captain. Thank you for filling in the blanks on this incident this weekend. 